Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. Hey, let's stand and worship together. Good morning <laughs> again. Glad to have everybody here, whether you're joining us in person, online. I'm Ethan. I'm the lead pastor. I'm also going to be speaking. I usually don't do this. I'm not comfortable doing announcements. I'm not comfortable being in front of people. That's a lie. Anyway, <laughs> we're, gl we're glad you've, uh, you've chosen to join us. Hopefully you got a program when you came in, printed program. That's really where all of the stuff that I could tell you is all located. It's all in there. Important things that are going on coming up at the church, things that are always happening, small groups, small Bible, stu Bible studies, they're all different kinds of things. That's your place for that. Instead of me going through all of it, I know you can read. Your connect card perforates, it tears off of that. That's for everybody to engage with. You can, whether it's signing up for something, letting us know you were here. If you're newer around here, give us your info, let us know how we can pray for you. All that stuff happens on the connect card. You can put those in the offering boxes in that little hallway as you head out. Of course, that's also how we take our offering. 
for those who contribute, who say, this is our, my church home. This is, this is where I place my passions, my, my support, and I give back to God from what he has given to me. That's what that is about, okay? Before we continue in worship this morning, why don't we pray together? God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for an opportunity to gather with God's people to simply unite our voices and our hearts and our minds. God, draw us to yourself this morning. Be glorified in what happens in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up and continue worshiping.
presence here this morning. God, we thank you for uh, a country where we can freely worship you. Um, we just thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I want everyone to start off here, if you turn on your Bibles, if you would, to the passage in Scripture about how if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. You know, the, the, whole, the whole chapter on, on self-reliance, self-actualization, anyone got that passage? Come on, you know, the section in the Bible about the, the power of determination and the human spirit, where all the motivational slogans come from. Surely someone can find the verse that says, they can't beat you if you never give up, or you can do anything you set your mind to, or make each day your masterpiece. I need to find those in the Bible. My whole message is built on this stuff, people. Come on. Uh, here we go. How about this one? Uh, <clears throat> Baloney 210. Shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll still land among the stars. Okay, back to the real world here. What kind of mindless, empty bunk is that? First of all, first of all, the moon is really, really big, okay? The size of that circle that we see in the night sky has a diameter across of almost 2,200 miles. That's big. Not only that, the moon has its own gravity well, which means that even if you shoot and don't get dead on but come pretty close, you're probably going to be pulled on to the moon anyway. So if you're shooting to land on the moon, sounds like you got a pretty good chance. But if you totally swing and miss on hitting the moon, you won't simply land among the stars. The closest star to the moon is 93 million miles away, which is about the distance of like 430 moons lined up together. And that star would be our sun, which will incinerate you in a split second if you get even remotely close to it. So the most likely scenario then, if you shoot for the moon and miss, is that you'll plunge through the infinite black void of space with only the sound of your breath in your spacesuit to keep you company until you meet your fate. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> All right, so, so, so not only that, 
But if we are talking about this phrase in its intended figurative language, even then it doesn't really work. I mean, listen here, Dreamweaver. In real life, when you, f <laughs> when you fail, there's no prizes for coming pretty close, no trophies for good intentions, and no soft pillow of marshmallow clouds to cushion you from the consequences and repercussions of your missteps, your bad preparation, your bad ideas, and miscalculations, okay? Now, now that I've made most of you mad, cranky, and despondent in the first 60 seconds of my message, I want to offer hope. Great news about you, in fact. It's what this series is going to be about for the next five weeks. See, we are, we are surrounded by books and podcasts and webinars, motivational wallpapers that, that champion the cause of the human spirit, that tell us that with enough willpower, enough self-confidence, grit, and hard work, we can achieve anything we imagine for ourselves, except what happens when we don't? Where does that leave us when we struggle, when we fail, when we are left holding broken pieces of those hopes and dreams? What then? <clears throat> you see, God's word has a different message. You can't handle it. You don't have what it takes. You are not strong enough, good enough, brave enough, or smart enough. But in your weakness, you are strong. With God, all things are possible, things like that. Over these next five weeks, that's the kind of good news about you we're going to talk about. See, the Bible is not a self-help book about becoming a stronger and unstoppable you. It's about a God who loves you more than you understand, about a new you, a, a, a you defined by and dependent on God's love and grace. None of those pithy phrases I rattled off at the beginning are in the Bible, of course. You see, the Bible, not Hollywood or social media or politics or cultural fads, the Bible is our authority source. And the stake that we kind of put in the ground at this church is to say that we place ourselves under the lordship of Jesus, under the authority of his word, so that we might be transformed by him, might connect with and serve those who are disconnected in the process who are lonely and suffering, who feel trapped by sin, people who desperately need the hope of a God who loves them. So on the heels of the series we finished last Sunday, where we used the book of Galatians to talk about what it means to live in God's freedom, and then to cap that off, yesterday a whole bunch of us gathered downstairs to, to dream together, to explore some exciting conversations and ideas about about uh, what might be in store for us as a church, what God might be doing um, in our midst, what that might look like, how we can impact our community for Jesus. But before we charge full steam ahead with any of those kind of things, any of the big things we might explore in the future, it seemed like a good idea, maybe a good and right thing, to ask what good and necessary things God might want to do inside of us that the work that he might want to do in us here and now, that kind of heart and soul housekeeping that God desires to make happen in our lives. So today, <clears throat> we're kicking off this new series, and here's the idea. Uh, between now and Easter, we're going to talk about the reality of our spiritual condition, mine and yours. We're going to make every effort to seek God honestly and with fresh eyes and hearts, recognizing that on our own, we are not good enough strong enough, moral enough, whatever, <clears throat> to manage it all, to do what it takes. So as we go into this series, I'm going to ask every one of us to kind of begin this spring together, this season, by, by asking, by allowing God to shine a light, to reveal truth about me, about you, about us, to let us see and come to terms with those things about ourselves that we need to hear, even if those are hard things. Because we believe that when we follow God's way, his reality is great news. But see, here's the challenging thing about knowing the truth about ourselves. We all have this problem. We all suffer from a kind of spiritual blind spot. Think of it this way. <clears throat> um, there's a group of people, and somebody's off. Like, like a choir with one person always singing off key. Or a small group with that one person who always overshares and takes every conversation hostage. Or a gathering of co-workers and there's that one person who always gets way too close and violates everyone's personal space, right? When someone has a problem like that, who's always the last to know? It's the person who has the problem, right? Here's what I mean. 
the truth about you, the news about you this morning is you don't know the news about you. The truth about you is you don't know the full truth about you. Other people know. They talk about it with each other. But today's news about you that's true for all of us is that we don't fully know the truth about us, and it's a problem. About 25 years ago, a few years, uh, for a few years when Debbie and I lived in Georgia, uh, now Debbie's going to be mortified that I'm sharing this story because she gets so embarrassed for me, but it's a perfect illustration of this truth this morning. Uh, if I remember, <clears throat> I think I was headed out for a work party or something, but I stopped at a local grocery store beforehand. For the life of me, I can't recall the reason for this, but I was dressed in a rather loud outfit. Maybe it was a costume party. I don't know. Anyway, I was wearing this kind of like really wild 70s print disco shirt with a big collar and these obnoxious matching bright orange hip hugger pants, really tight. And I'm strutting through the grocery store, picking up a variety of things. And I'm just getting looks left and right. I assumed it was because of my outfit. They were pretty impressed. But then I get to the checkout and the poor girl at the register, she seemed kind of uptight, not really making eye contact. Seemed a little odd, and I'm trying to kind of get a read on the situation. Is there a shoplifter around or something? What's going on? And then the receipt finally prints out, and she starts writing on the back. Figured it was some stupid customer survey or something, so I'm probably rolling my eyes. But she finally hands me the receipt, and written on the back in big letters to make sure I didn't miss it were three words, check your fly. That day, the truth about me was I didn't know the truth about me. I was very unaware of something everyone else around me was very much aware of, and that thing very, very much needed to be addressed. So that's the great news about you today. The truth about you <laughs> is you don't know the truth about you. This is an enormous problem with our human condition. It's true of me, it's true of you. It's been written about through the generations. Dostoevsky would say, every man has reminiscences which he would not tell to everyone, but only to his friends. He has other matters in his mind which he would not reveal even to his friends, but only to himself. Here's the kicker. But there are yet other things which a man is afraid to tell even to himself. The Bible has actually quite a lot to say about this problem. <clears throat> it's kind of the launch point for our series. So we need to honestly and soberly take stock uh, of who we really are, the truth about us, so that God can do in us and through us what we can't do on our own. I mean, after all, like we saw last series, Jesus himself said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, <clears throat> you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's one of the verses that are referenced in those laminated pew cards about who we are as a church and why we do what we do. So maybe, maybe you call yourself a Christian, maybe you don't, maybe you're not sure. But regardless of what you believe, this affects you. Theologians and sociologists, psychologists of all worldviews have observed this same thing. You have a problem, and that problem is you don't know the full truth about you. And through the teachings and the life stories in the Bible, we realize what these experts have observed was actually written about generations before in God's word. <clears throat> we all suffer from this. No one is so good, so strong of character, so well-informed, so spiritually and psychologically in tune that they're immune to this. And right now, some of you are thinking, Ethan, what the heck? This is series is called Good News About You. That sounds like pretty bad news if you ask me. I came here for a dose of hope, a pick-me-up, a shot in the arm for my week, and instead, <clears throat> I'm getting a lesson on all my hidden flaws? Yes. Yep. But I'll throw you the spoiler up front. <clears throat> the great news is where all this can take you. When you finally come to terms with all those things that have been weighing you down and holding you back, those things that have been deceiving you and manipulating you and keeping you in traps and change, when all those things are finally brought to light and called out and dealt with, you can finally begin to move forward with an honesty, a freedom, a newness and confidence that you never had before. And that is great news. Of course, we've got some work to do to get there, right? So I want to talk about a story of one of the great characters in the Bible, King David, um, he was a guy who had quite a bit of his life and history and even his thoughts and his emotions chronicled in the Bible. 
And after all that, he's still referred to as a man after God's own heart. But just like us, the truth about David is he didn't fully know the truth about himself. Now, this is a story that's familiar to many of you. But one day, um, David, a king, has tons of money and power and even tons of wives. He saw the only wife of another much, le much less wealthy, less powerful man, and he took her just because he could, because his eyes liked what he saw, and she got pregnant. And then he used his wealth and his power and his influence to cover up what he'd done, a process that included manipulation, deception, and arranging a murder. Get this. <laughs> In the ancient world, you had politicians and people of power thinking that they could get away with wrongdoing and covering it up because of their position of power and influence. Isn't that crazy what used to happen back in the ancient world? <laughs> anyway, David literally destroyed that man's life. Time passes, eventually a baby is born. During that time, David keeps writing psalms, as far as we know, keeps leading Israel in worship as he did as a king, keeps serving God kind of as if he's a man of integrity, when in his heart he knows better. I mean, based on the, love, the God that he loves and worships, he has to know better, right? How does that happen? Eventually, a prophet named Nathan finds out about the whole mess. Uh, who knows? Maybe other people knew at this point, too. It's hard to keep layers of sin and deception a secret forever. So Nathan approaches David, and he says to him, Hey, David, uh, I need to tell you about a man with tons of money and power, and he had many sheep. And he saw the only sheep of, a ma of another man, a much less wealthy and, and powerful man. <clears throat> the, the rich, powerful man had an honored guest passing through in town, and he took the one sheep from the poor man just because he could, even though he had tons of livestock of his own. He slaughtered the poor man's one beloved sheep to feed his passing guest. You can read the whole story in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. Now, you and I... After reading about what David had done wrong and all the layers of sin and deception he'd been covering up, we, of course, know what Nathan's talking about. And it's actually pretty genius what Nathan's doing here. He's giving David the opportunity to voluntarily come clean, to come out of hiding. Maybe David will start to hear this story and slowly start to hang his head. But that's not what happens. Nathan tells David about this man and then waits for David's response. But instead of responding with guilt or shame or embarrassment or confession, David's furious at the man in the story. It says, David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. <clears throat> I want you to see something. The text said that David's heart burned with anger, a real emotion. That means he's not putting on a show. He's actually angry at the man in Nathan's story. His self-deception runs that strong. And then David actually says, as surely as the Lord lives. You hear the righteous indignation in that? And really, David, he deserves to die? That man whose crime is exponentially less dark, less premeditated and layered, less serious than yours, that man deserves to die? And you, David, pronounce the judgment? Nathan cuts through David's piety. He says in verse 7, it says, Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. The searing, painful truth is laid out in those four words. You are the man. You are the woman. The person. It's you. Joseph Butler was an Anglican uh, bishop in the 1700s. In one of his sermon manuscripts about this exact biblical story, he wrote, Many men seem perfect strangers to their own characters. Sometimes we can't feel the conviction of the difficult truth about ourselves when it's staring us in the face. Ask any pastor. We've all heard a Sunday morning comment, something like this. Preacher, that was a great message. I know some people who really need to hear that one. And I promise you, if any one of you this morning comes up and says that to me, I'm going to respond with, you are that person. <laughs> this is what we need to talk about because it runs so deep in us. Uh, Victor Crawford, this is kind of a, a somewhat famous story. Victor Crawford was an attorney and a Maryland state legislate, legislator. He was a lobbyist for the tobacco industry in the 1980s. His career was, was, was built on working to defeat any legislation that might cut into corporate tobacco profits. He was a lifelong smoker himself, and he ended up with throat cancer at 59, died a few years after that. But I want you to hear what he said shortly before he died. 
He basically said that he thought he got what he deserved. And this is the quote, because in my heart, I knew better. And because I could always rationalize it. He said, that's how you make a living, by rationalizing that black is not black. Remember the Dostoevsky quote? There are yet other things which a man is afraid to tell even to himself. Which is precisely why we read in 2 Samuel 12, 7 that Nathan is the one who has to say to David, you are the man. The truth about you is you don't know the truth about you. Self-deception is such a remarkable phenomenon. If I deceive someone else, it's because I know the truth and they don't. I hide it from them, right? One person doesn't know, the other person does know. We certainly understand that. But how can I deceive myself? How can I be both the deceiver and the one who is deceived? Or as Jeremiah asks, he says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? No kidding. The answer, of course, the reality is somewhere. Somehow, at some level, we do know. That's what Victor Crawford identified when he said, in my heart, I knew. And he went on to say, but I rationalized and I denied because the money was so good. That's what he said. He says, I could always rationalize it. So I made a living by rationalizing that black is not black. I want to give us a question, a sort of self-examination to help identify this condition in us. Because I genuinely believe that God wants to do something in us. <clears throat> wants to begin some newness of conviction and challenge. Make us more and more like Jesus in this church family. In this culture where we're so quick to, to project the image of ourselves to others that we want to see. So I want to, ask, I want to ask you to ask yourself this question. I don't want you to ask this question to your spouse or the person that's been in your mind since we started this message. Don't do that. Just stop. This is a question for me, for you, for each of us, individually only, and it requires brutal honesty. Here goes. Here's your question. Am I quicker to pass judgment on other people than I am to see the painful truth about myself? In essence, to pass judgment on myself. Am I quicker to pass judgment on other people than I am to see the painful truth about myself? Am I quicker to notice it, critique it, call it out in others than I am to see it and call it out and feel the pain about it myself. That's kind of the question that Nathan brings to David when he tells him the story of the man with the sheep. And David can call it out and get all upset when he sees it in someone else, but can't, or maybe more accurately won't, see a much more devastating version of that same mess in himself. Is it any wonder Jesus would say in Matthew 7, why do you look at a speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? And pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. <clears throat> David's the king, and in that day, part of the king's job is to hear cases and dispense judgment and justice. So when Nathan brings in the story, David can very clearly see the wrongdoing of someone else with great clarity. <clears throat> to the point of anger and passion for justice burning in his heart, while David is absolutely and utterly blind to what's in his own character and behavior. We've all seen this. We've all experienced this. There's those people who who seem to have like 20-20 vision for the faults and the flaws and the missteps of others. But it's like they have a blindfold on when it comes to themselves. Uh, Not you, of course. Probably not even anyone in this room. But some people do. Um, Jesus uses a similar... Notice there was no laughing there. Interesting. Anyway, (laughs) Jesus uses a similar metaphor about the eyes in Luke 11. He says, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body also is full of light. But when they are unhealthy, your body also is full of darkness. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. That's a great verse. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, is clear, is unclouded, that's also how that can be translated, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, Or if I may take some creative liberties, if you can't see the truth about you, the whole of you will be full of darkness. Uh, In case you missed the the obvious here in what Jesus is saying, I'll point it out. Jesus is not talking about our eyes being healthy and unclouded in order to detect sin in others. This is all about the health of our own selves. The eye is the lamp of our body. 
and our ability to see clearly and honestly is what brings light to our body and our whole being. I mean, look, how many of you didn't need glasses when you were 19, but now that you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, your prescription has changed, and you need glasses. Now, some of you won't wear them, of course, because you think you're good enough without them. <clears throat> um, and then, <laughs> even beyond the prescription glasses, some of us need readers, right? Because it's like one problem with the eyes isn't, isn't good enough. There's got to be multiple ways that the eyes are going bad. This is just biologically true. There's a degree of loss of focusing ability and loss of fineness of perception in our physical vision that just comes with age. <clears throat> I remember when my grandmother was still alive, and um, before she needed to surrender her driver's license, I'd be riding with her. <clears throat> and she thought all the other cars were speeding so recklessly. They were all such animals. And it seemed to her that all drivers stopped so suddenly or would follow so close. See, her perception and focus was changing and shifting. That's what happens. But she believed it was everyone around her that was the problem. As you might expect, she didn't respond well when I pointed out that those cars were not actually going 100 miles an hour. She was actually traveling nearly 10 miles an hour below the speed limit. That was what the problem was. She didn't respond well. But see, that's what happens. The eye lens loses its flexibility. It gets hardened. Its capacity to focus and discern and perceive diminishes. It's true for many of us in real life. I mean, the closer something is sometimes, the less well you're able to see it. You should see those of us on staff proofreading the printed program every week. It's like a game of who can hold it the farthest away. But see, that's exactly what we're talking about when it comes to the spiritual truth about each of us. Sometimes, the longer we're at this, the harder it can be to see up close. We get so used to living with that self-deception that we don't even know it's happening. And the difficult truth is sometimes our religious old age, if you will, can keep us from seeing the truth about ourselves. We talked about this from one angle when we got into legalism in our last series. See, it's why James writes, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. And maybe you're like me, you've read that verse before and you think, I don't really get that illustration. It seems ridiculous. Nobody forgets what they look like. Are you so sure? Scenario for you. You wake up in the morning. You feel decently well rested, no random leg cramps or unexplainable morning bloating. So you take a sip of coffee, you stretch your arms, you wander into the bathroom, and you turn on that tell-all bathroom light. Now pause, pause. Right here, right at that moment as you're about to turn on the bathroom light, every one of us has an internal picture of our mind of what we believe we're going to see in that mirror, right? So you flip on the light, except what you see in that mirror is actually a horrible disfiguration of what you believed and hoped you would see. And it, what, it, what, it, what it makes it so awful is you know that you're looking at the unavoidable, inescapable truth, unless you're that person that's like, honey, this mirror's warped, we need a new one. There are things happening to the elasticity of your skin and the color of your hair and the swollen bags under your eyes and the sheer volume of that extra chin and all kinds of observations that don't exist in that picture of you in your mind. I mean, look, has anyone ever here looked in the mirror and seen something they don't like? Has that ever happened for anybody? Does anyone other than me ever experience this phenomenon? <laughs> well, now, here's the thing, though. If you're a woman, at least you can technically do something about it because of our cultural norm of the magic of makeup, right? But if you're a guy, what you see when you look in the mirror in the morning, that's as good as it's going to get, guys. That's all we got. That's it. Sorry. <laughs> James says the Bible can be that kind of a mirror. That God's word can be for my soul what a mirror can be for my face. And that unchanging, consistent reference point of truth from God, from His Holy Spirit, is so critical for our self-awareness. It's way deeper than just my perception of myself according to my estimation. That's almost meaningless when it comes to this deep truth about us. God's Word is our mirror of truth about us. But I think I also need to say this. See, if I read the Bible the wrong way, if I read it without actually desiring 
to be changed by it, without desiring to do what it says, without actually seeking or wanting to discover truth about myself, if I do that, I can actually misuse the Bible to deceive myself even more. To think, what a good person I am because I'm reading the Bible. Look at how much I'm saturating my life in God's Word. I'm a pretty admirable Christian, aren't I? See, this is right back to what we talked about last last series, just last Sunday. Remember when Paul said in Galatians 6, 3, if anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. He goes on to instruct us to evaluate, to test ourselves against God's word. This message is all over the scriptures. Romans 12, 3 says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. Now, of course, we we live in a culture swarming with self-affirmation. It's why these motivational self-help posters and desktop wallpapers are all over the place. And we don't often hear words like Paul's here where where he says, I want all you to hear this because it's too easy to deceive yourself. And that puts you at great risk. It will not end well. So I want every one of you to hear these words. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. And note how Paul says, I tell you this by the grace given me. Because truth truth and grace are not opposed to each other. Truth is a gift of grace. Or as Jesus said in John 8, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I want to challenge us this week. And moving through this series to really take this seriously. To allow the mirror of God's word to begin to show us the truth about ourselves. We're so deeply wired to push back at anything that may be a hard truth. Even small things. I mean, I've been trying to kind of monitor my conversations and my responses this week. And I'll tell you, I have been alarmed at how effortless it sometimes is for me to respond with a pushback if I get even a sniff that a comment might cast me in a bad light. And it's not like I have to strategize or creatively maneuver my thoughts to do that. It's just reflexive. And when I've caught myself doing that, now maybe it isn't like this for you, but here's kind of what this is like for me. It's like the kid's cartoon of Angel Ethan and Devil Ethan on my shoulders. Now, it's a silly illustration, but go with me here. When this happens, when I realize how effortlessly and reflexively I get defensive, there's a little battle between Devil Ethan and Angel Ethan. Angel Ethan says, why did you do that? Why is it so automatic to defend yourself? Did it ever occur to you that there might be truth you need to learn about yourself? And Devil Ethan roars right back with some really, really convincing argument for why I absolutely should have responded that way. You see, facing the truth about me can be incredibly painful. That's how it is for us. But the release and the newness and freedom that comes from that is always worth it. The truth will set you free, but first it will probably make you miserable. That's just the truth about the truth. The truth about me is not only do I not know the whole truth about me, but too often I don't even want to know the whole truth about me. But get this, the great news about me, about you, is that only God knows the entire staggering, ugly truth about any one of us. And he sent his son Jesus, who is truth, to set us free. Now I have a very specific challenge today for every one of us in this room, but before we get to that, We're going to do something else. We're going to spend some time reflecting on the work of Jesus Christ, the truth, who set us free from from that debilitating truth about us, set us free from our sin and slavery of trying to be good enough. He broke those chains on the cross where his grace is offered to restore us, to free us, to make us new. We remember that every week by taking communion together. Hopefully you picked up a self-serve packet when you made your way in here. If you didn't, there's extras in the pew. So I'm just going to ask each of us to spend some time in reflection, in meditation at the foot of the cross where the body and blood of Jesus were given for us so that we could come, could confess, could be washed clean to remember how we've been set free by the truth, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray and then we'll take communion together. Heavenly Father, this morning uh, we, we collectively pray together that your spirit would guide us, would begin to shine a light. God, maybe even more importantly, that we would begin to allow that. 
Because, God, you long to set us free. Your son was sacrificed on that cross so that we could be set free, so that we could experience your forgiveness and grace. God, thank you for this incredible gift. Thank you for your word that is our mirror. God, work in our hearts this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take communion.
One defense, my righteousness, O oh God, how I need you. It, it takes honesty and vulnerability to say that and to mean it. It doesn't necessarily take honesty and vulnerability to sing it, but it's a raw statement of truth about us, isn't it? To say, God, you're my defense, you're my rock, my, my bottom line, my foundation, you're what makes me good or righteous or anything else. You sustain me, you uphold me, I need you. That's raw and that's vulnerable. It's honest. That's a statement of truth about us. But here's the other great news about you this morning. We said this last week. The great news about you is God's not done with you yet. I believe there's work, there's renewal, there's transformation he wants to do right here in our midst in these coming weeks and months. So I want to tell you what we're going to do this morning, how we're going to end things out. In just a minute, we're going to be singing a closing song, and we're going to do this kind of old school. We're going to make this like an old revival. We're actually going to be doing it this way through the whole series, and I want you to know that so that you can kind of think about that ahead of time, because I don't want to miss out on anything that God may be doing in our lives, ways that his Holy Spirit may be stirring in our hearts, getting the attention of our conscience. Because I don't want to miss out on that opportunity, we're going to make this available over all these weeks, Okay. Because it's important that you know that that's available to you if you have decisions that you're sorting through, things that you need to surrender, things that you need to make new, ways you need to discover healing. So each week here, know that you will not only have an opportunity to do that, but you will also have a challenge, a prompting to make good on those decisions, to do something about it. So here's what we're going to do. I have kind of a, a posture of prayer that we're going to spend a little bit of time in. And then once we start to sing together, I'm just going to invite anyone who needs to come clean in God's presence, who needs to begin the process of letting God's Spirit confront some hard truth in their lives, who needs to be set free by the truth of Jesus Christ and step into new life, any decision to come forward anytime while we're singing. I'll be up here, so will some elders. Just come at any point while we're singing together, and you can respond that way. Okay, we'll talk together about how to respond. Maybe it's a small decision, a small conviction, but it's going to lead to some big changes in your life. Maybe it's a big decision, a big conviction. Maybe you're ready to walk in the way and the truth of Jesus for the first time, to step into these waters of baptism and proclaim Christ's lordship in your life. Maybe it's any number of ways you simply need to confess to God the truth about you and let him begin to make you new one step at a time. Now, not everybody's a, a raging public person. You can also shoot me a message. You can find me after this is done. You can mark your Connect card and, and, and start a conversation that way. The, the point is, the opportunity is in front of you. Don't leave that alone. That's the whole point. To let God begin to make you new one step at a time. So I'm going to lead us in this kind of guided prayer a prayer where I'm going to offer a few things and then encourage all of us to pray those things in our own words to God. I'm going to move through just a little bit of that, and then we're going to sing together, okay? And it's going to be kind of a song, an upbeat song of proclamation and of courage, and that's okay. But that's what we're going to do. Would you bow your heads and join with me in this posture of prayer? God, this morning we, we praise you. We thank you for your, your boundless love for us a love that endures, a love that perseveres. God, thank you that nothing can ever change or take away that love. And thank you for paying the price for the ugly truth about our sin through your son. I just want to encourage everyone right now to express all of that, their gratitude to God right now in their own words. Let's do that. God, we want to be bold and confident because of that love, because we know that there's no truth about us that will make you love us more or less. God, you already know the truth about us, and therefore, God, we want to begin to receive that truth that we need to know about us. We want to ask you to remake us, to let us know as much truth about ourselves as we can bear to hear, 
God, just like that mirror tells us the truth about our physical selves, would you reveal to us through your word, through your spirit, the truth of our character, our speech, our habits, our ego. God, all so that you can do the work that you want to do within us, that we can be made new. Would you pray that to God right now? Give God's spirit permission to do that this morning. Father God, right now, um, would you stir in us, begin to reveal truth to us about how you want us to respond to all of this today, this morning, this week, this month, these days ahead, what you want us to do and who you want us to be. God, stir in us here to make a decision just about this moment, whatever it is that you're tugging on our hearts about, about this week, about a certain situation. God, knowing that from now on, things can be different. With your help, we, we can be more receptive to the truth about us. God, we want to be as wide open as your spirit enables us to be. So God, this morning, by the power of your Holy Spirit, we desire for what happened between, between Nathan and David to maybe happen right here within us. That we would have ears to listen to that voice that says, you are that man, you are that woman. And then God, we ask you to give us the courage the bravery to begin to allow you to take off that, that hard scale of deception and stubbornness around our hearts. God, plunge us into the river of your grace that makes us clean and new. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If anything that you prayed just now or that uh, occurred to your heart just now has brought you to a place of wanting or needing to respond in any kind of public way this morning, like I said, that's available to you. I invite you to come forward anytime as we sing or proclaim together about the fear of being washed away and being made brave. Let's stand and sing together.
so much for joining us this morning. Know that we will have that opportunity throughout this series, but that, that opportunity never goes away. That's always open. After any service, any time, the discussion, the, my door is always open. Don't ever leave that stuff on your own shoulders. That's always true. Make sure you put any connect cards, offerings, etc. in the boxes as you head out. Invite a friend to join us this series. This is definitely going to be a kind of a series that's great for those that are still kind of skeptical, still kind of exploring. It's just going to be great for that, okay? Have a great Sunday. See you next time.